Maybe you are thinking about buying Star Wars Squadrons, or maybe you just want a super lightweight look at whether it's worth purchasing. Well, this is where you should be. Here's a list of things that I'll cover super quickly to help you get a general idea about the game. Here we go. Genre comparison. Star Wars Squadrons continues along a line of games like Rogue Squadron, Starfighter and Battle for Naboo where you pilot the iconic ships of the Star Wars universe. You will complete missions that will see you flying your ship through debris fields, dogfighting other fighters and taking on the bulkier ships of both the Rebel and Empire fleet. For the single player story, you see yourself flipping back and forth between missions as part of the New Republic's Vanguard Squadron and the Imperial Titan Squadron as the story unfolds from two sides of the same conflict. This duality has its value outside of just the storytelling as it will afford you the opportunity to fly a wide array of different ships from both sides of the greater Star Wars conflict, 8 in total. I don't play a lot of these piloting or flight sim games, so it is difficult for me to draw a comparison to other games in the genre, like Elite Dangerous or Ace Combat, but I do remember fondly playing Rogue Squadron back in my childhood, and I remember playing Battle for Naboo on the PC in my youth, and that's the same feeling of going on a mission to help turn the tide of the battle that occurs in Squadrons, a feeling I was chasing when I picked up this title. For the core game loop. If you have played any of the previous Star Wars starfighting games, you know what to do. You are given an objective, you go to it, and you shoot it. Maybe you escort it, and maybe you arrive at it, but vastly more often, you shoot it. There are a few buckets of gameplay worth mentioning for the core game loop. Dogfighting, larger craft, and objective play. Dogfighting is the majority of what the missions in Squadrons entail. You have your dinky little craft, and you go out in the abyss of space. And the only thing between you and the cold, quiet doom is a small array of subsystems, some Star Wars glass, and your wits as a pilot. You will tumble and roll and manoeuvre to get your enemy in your sights. Line them up, lead the shot before firing a volley of laser fire and watching their craft puff into a small ball of flame in the distance. Props to EA Motive for replicating the look of the explosions from the original trilogy too. Larger craft will appear to support their allies, but with skillful flying and some manipulation of your subsystems, you can quickly move power to where it is needed most. Get in close, blasting the enemy with a barrage of plasma as you make your pass. And finally, the path is clear to your objective. Prioritise your targets and keep fighters off you while you damage critical enemy infrastructure to allow your allies to carry out the mission. Destroy points of weakness, clear out gun turrets, destroy buildings and equipment and keep your allies safe. Maybe some of you are thinking, but what is my motivation for all this? I'll cover story later in the view, so just hold tight. If story isn't your thing, then there are also two multiplayer modes. Dogfight, which is the team deathmatch of Star Wars Squadrons, Imperials vs the New Republic. Pick a craft and dial in your loadout, first to 30 kills wins. This normally goes for about 10 minutes. Once you get to level 5 in the multiplayer, you unlock fleet battles in which you will attack an enemy to move an advantage line forward. Once you succeed in this enough, you will be able to assault the larger craft on the enemy team, with the eventual goal of destroying their capital ship for the win. This mode requires a bit more time so you might want to put like 30 or 40 minutes aside. This is where your time will go. Let's look at what makes that time cool. Key standout features. So we are across what you do in the game. What are some of the standout features that make this worth investing in? Simple but complex. Flying around in your Starfighter is pretty cool, but it isn't really enough complexity to carry an entire game in 2020 through a roughly 10 hour campaign and potentially a bunch more hours of dogfighting and fleet battling in the multiplayer. To remedy this, some small additions have been made to the larger and most immediate game loops to add some complexity back in. The simplest addition is the different crafts and loadouts. Each side, Imperial and the New Republic, have four ships to choose from. Imperials being the classic TIE models and the new Reaper ship, and for the New Republic, the classic Rebel ships plus the addition of the U-Wing. To add to this, ships can be modified with different loadouts. Loadouts allow players to customise the components of the ship to tailor it better to certain situations. Hull, shield, lasers, engine, and different auxiliary components can be changed out. To make the minute-to-minute -minute gameplay more interesting, ships also have a power redirection system that is straight out of all the best sci-fi. The player chooses whether the power of the craft gets balanced between the shields, engines, and lasers, or they can choose to send more power to the subsystem of their choice, at the expense of the other two systems. To tackle situations most effectively, the player will be switching back and forth between these subsystems frequently, making moment-to-moment -moment gameplay a balance between managing your craft's integrity, completing your objective, and making sure the power is in the right place to support both of these things. There are obviously benefits to routing power to different systems. 
More power in lasers will make them recharge faster. Power in engines makes the craft faster and more maneuverable. And power in shields makes shields recharge faster and take less time to begin recharging. On top of these efficiency benefits, there is a system specific benefit for each one. Full powered lasers do more damage. Full powered shields will begin charging an overshield, which adds to the base shields. And full powered engines will build boost, which can be spent to boost up to very fast speeds. But Michael, you say, Imperial lightcraft don't have shields. Right you are, Harry. No shields on Sundays. Each faction has a faction-specific ability. The Imperial craft don't have shields because that's how ties are manufactured. So instead, the Imperial craft have a power converter. This allows the player to divert all power to one system, lasers or engines, for a big time play. The Republic have shields, so they are too busy routing power to all the different systems for a power converter. So instead, the Republic craft can choose to prioritize forward or rear shields or leave them in a balanced state. The way this all ties back into the way you will experience the game is that you will be able to use these tools to approach situations that you are in most effectively. If you are dogfighting, you will be switching between systems to evade, recharge, and decimate enemies. Or you are lining up for a run on a capital ship, you shift to shields and charge the overshield, you swap to lasers and bombard the surface with fire and missiles. Clearing the ship, you swap the shields to your rear, moving all remaining shield power to the back and flick to the engines as you make a speedy escape ducking, weaving, and boosting away. VR boo boo. Now I know most of you won't have VR, but hear me out for a moment, because I think the standard non-VR game also benefits from VR without even needing the headset due to some smart design decisions. So this is one of those games that benefits pretty heavily from peripherals. Playing squadrons with a flight stick is a different and I would say better experience for both control and immersion. But the best play experience by far is in VR with your input device of choice. I think it's safe to assume that Squadrons was probably built ground up as a VR product and then partway through development pivoted to also be a release for traditional screen media. Things like the first person perspective, the hangers locked off position where you can only rotate on the spot as with the briefing room. These things show a clear intent for a VR experience, but that's not bad. The perspective is always locked off to the first person. So you really feel like a pilot in each of the story Squadrons. No matter the screen, it's immersive. Briefings are to you and your team, not in some flashy cutscene. The biggest difference the VR Origins brings with it though, for all screen types, is the use of diegetic UI that is part of the world. If this was a monitor first game, the UI would look vastly different, so as to always allow maximum clarity and ease of access to the information. It would be bars and flat sprites and text logs. VR Dev strives to make the most immersive experience possible. So that means a different approach to information where it is integrated into the world where possible. So these cockpit bars and readouts and screens only happen with a ground up VR build that pivots afterwards. I love this UI. The little array of bulbs that show the power levels in the X-Wings, the multiple nice screens in the tie, the wide dashboards of the Reaper and the U-Wing, the claustrophobia of it all it adds to the experience of being a pilot big time. And every player gets this, not just the VR players. This also translates into a difficulty mode too, where you can just rely on all of the diegetic instruments and the other non-diegetic info will be turned off. But let's not forget this game is a perfect fit for VR. So if you own a VR headset, this is the way that you wanna play this game. In terms of gameplay, VR provides the opportunity to look around while you send the ship in a different direction. Whether that's to track a target across the screen that is trying to evade you, to observe your surroundings, or even just get your bearings. It offers a distinct advantage in multiplayer modes also for these reasons. But mainly, you just want to play in VR because it's freaking awesome. Being in the room for a rebel briefing and being able to look around at your comrades and look back and forth between the commander and the holograms Looking around the hangars gives you a sense of place and a sense of scale that you don't get from a normal monitor or TV. And flying the ship, craning your neck to see the enemy you are targeting, glancing down at your dials to get a status update, feeling how cramped the cockpit is, and even just looking around at all the cool visuals as you coast towards your objective, you almost, almost feel like you're right there. And it's magnificent. Major points of issue. Right, why might you not like it? Before we go over the next point, I just want to say that I am aware that this is a more limited title than EA might usually fund, and that many of the reasons this game isn't quite what I wanted would be due to the more limited scope stemming from the original VR intent. Areas are reused for the multiplayer. 
There is no ground missions, probably just down to the cost of creating them. I am willing to throw them a bone here. But with that said, this is still a $30 US title, 50 Aussie dollars. EA is still asking for the same amount of money as some other pretty premium titles. So I will throw them a bone, but I won't let it slide. Mission and level design is meh. As part of the marketing for the Squadrons game, a short animatic was released featuring the ditch effort of a stranded Empire pilot to escape his rebel pursuer. It's a great little vertical slice of Star Wars and a cool short. As with most pre-rendered trailers and marketing material though, it was super cool, but also entirely lies. I bring it up because it's directly related to the game and represents a model for what a really amazing mission could have been. Starting in space with reduced system capability, having to hide and not be seen, getting discovered and having to make your way to the atmosphere, a canyon run while evading fire erupts into a dogfight between pilots, two enter, one leave, and finishing on a crash landing set piece. What a cool, varied mission. Few, if none of the missions, are like that. I'm not saying they are bad, let me be very clear about that, but I will say that the mission design is a little lackluster, as is the level design. Some of the missions do have good gimmicks. I'll save you the spoilers, but they have cool things to interact with or fun unique objectives. Contrastingly, mission gameplay objectives, more often than not, regularly boil down to shooting fighters. Shooting fighters is fun, but maybe not for 14 missions. Every once in a while you will get thrown a larger ship, like a Star Destroyer or this Imperial Raider, to fight to break things up, but then it's back to the Starfighters. This might be fine if the spaces you were navigating provided some spin on the mechanics. Again, there are some cool spaces where you fly inside things or around things, but in general the game just goes, here's a giant sphere that is mostly empty, it has some floating debris in it, so that's some variety that acts as an obstacle. Okay, shoot a bunch of stuff. The other part of this equation is the game is entirely set in space. So there is no real ground play or bombing missions or anything that you might find takes place on a planet. You know, like Hoth or something like that. There isn't really any parts where technical flying or speed or choice is required. Now the next point is a personal feeling rather than a recommendation, but I feel like there was an opportunity missed to have some pretty cool mission structure where maybe you attack a facility and you have multiple ways to complete an objective that could be tailored to different craft, or even just a larger variety of mission objectives outside of shooting stuff. Things like racing or hiding, time limit bound objectives like scanning enough things, flying slowly under radar, just a wider variety of things to do. Obviously, depending on how much you like shooting things in your Starfighter will determine how much mileage this point has for you. Personal opinion. So I haven't really spoken too much about the story so far. I liked it. The synopsis is that the New Republic, formerly the Rebels, are gathering the requirements for a secret project that turns out to be a giant weapon, and the Imperials catch wind of it and intend to stop them. It is a very quintessential story from the Star Wars universe, but it gets the job done and has some interesting twists and turns to it. The delivery through the player, experiencing both factions sides of the story for parts, works well to keep the pacing moving along and means that there is always a story reason to do something interesting. My only critique would be that the two main characters in the story have some history with each other, and an opportunity was missed to really break down this relationship. I imagine a nice simple three-act structure that just does cool Star Wars stuff was a good way to keep EA and Disney happy. It represents a missed opportunity in my books though, lacking a strong overall theme and not taking Star Wars to new ground despite the setup. Outside of this, I really like the game. The opportunity to fly a TIE fighter and X-Wing around in VR was just too good. One of those childhood dreams. And as I've been telling you and my friends, it's pretty sick. I really enjoyed the level of complexity to the systems that let you do attack runs and created those in the moment split seconds decision to switch out of lasers into shields or to push my luck and keep on the attack until the bigger ship died and then swap the shield priority around and get the hell out of there, sometimes pushing myself too far. I'm not much of a multiplayer person either, but the multiplayer was surprisingly fun too. Another level of challenge after finishing the story and then going to fight real humans that fly erratically and fight back harder. If I think you should buy. This is going to be one of those games where depending on what you value in a game will determine whether or not you should purchase it. The price is lower than usual, but it is a much smaller game. I would say that if you've ever wanted to fly a Starfighter from Star Wars around, it's death's work picking up. And even if you don't own a VR headset, they are becoming cheap enough that you may have one in a few years and you can return to it for a fresh look at the product. 
Overall, I think EA is making a play by not releasing additional content to make people ask for more. Then they'll probably go full Battlefront 2 on the next title. Or maybe they just intend to keep on Disney's good side so as not to lose the Star Wars license. But while EA is releasing really good titles for a flat price that aren't full of microtransactions or loot boxes or anything, I would say you should buy it if you want it to reinforce that this is what the consumer wants. And as consumers, we are probably buying more than one game a year, which is why I have this review style that points out the good and bad things in a game. Heading over to this set of reviews will land you on all of my other content like this. If you like this review, checking out another review helps me keep doing videos like this for you. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.